Well, good morning, Freedom Church. It's, uh, it's so good to, uh, to see you uh, this morning. My name is Michael White. I serve as one of the pastors here. I uh, do most of the preaching and teaching. And if, if you're a guest with us, we want to say a special welcome uh, to you. Um, going to do something I normally don't do and uh, just make a shameless plug or a, a, a push. So we are uh, we just started on Sunday nights uh, a marriage seminar. Uh, started last week. Aaron will have more about this uh, after the sermon the announcements. I just want to encourage you, uh, if you weren't here last week, uh, even if you've not registered, wh- why don't you come tonight? It was really, really excellent uh, last week. It was a really helpful, fruitful time to think about marriage. Coming to the marriage seminar, it's from five to six, child care is provided right here. So, uh, so you come. Coming is not saying like, hey, my marriage is in trouble. It's coming to say, hey, all of our marriages could be better than what they are, right? Um, and so if you would say, hey, I've got a healthy marriage, well, then come so your marriage stays healthy, right, and gets uh, even healthier. So I uh, would just encourage you to come. Steve Benson, who's a licensed professional counselor that we know, uh, he's doing the teaching, and he did a phenomenal job last week. So we just really encourage you uh, to come on back tonight uh, from five to six. So we're starting a new series uh, this morning called The Household of God. Uh, we're talking today about what is the church. I want you to turn your Bibles to Ephesians 2. Um, and while you're doing that, I just was thinking, as I was thinking about uh, this message and thinking about the church, you know, there are a lot of empires and organizations that have been great over the course of our planet's history, right? Um, and so I just got, I was curious, I'm a little bit of a nerd, geeky, whatever person, so I just start, start typing into Google, like, what was the biggest empire ever? And the world's, maybe I should have already known that, I don't know, uh, but I didn't. So, uh, so the world's largest empire ever in, in history belonged to the British. I should have figured this out, right? The British had the biggest empire. You can see the picture of the British empire there at, the, at its height. Um, it was 100 years ago, 1920, was, was when they were at their peak. Um, and at the largest part of the British Empire, they covered 22%, almost a quarter of the world's land mass. It's just insane, right? 13 million square miles was what they had. And a fifth, 20%, a fifth of the world's population. It's just stunning <laughs> that they controlled all of that. And then, then not far behind the British, um, and impressive to me because it had the most contiguous land area is what's up there now, the, uh, the Mongol Empire. The Mongol Empire was formed when Genghis Khan and uh, the Kurds, uh, sorry, not the Kurds, the Turks and the Mongols came together and uh, kind of united uh, what they had going, all the tribes. And so at its peak, around 1300, controlled 16% of the world's land mass, more than a quarter of the world's population. But the Mongol Empire is no more, right? Some of you maybe, I mean, I would struggle to do this, right? I don't even know if I can find Mongolia on a map. I know it's in Asia somewhere, right? British Empire, it's no more, right? Switch metaphors if history and geography is not your thing. Canton, Ohio. Canton, Ohio was home at one point to one of the world's greatest professional football teams, the Canton Bulldogs. You see them up there on the screen, right? They were in the pre-NFL era, pre-AFL, all that, Uh, but they became well-known, this is in like the 19-teens, for just the legendary play of of now Hall of Famer Jim Thorpe. Uh, So so they were a wonderful team, an excellent team, a dominating team. They were founding members of the NFL back in 1922. They won the first two NFL championships in 1922 and 23. They went undefeated. Still, in the record books, they hold the the record for most consecutive wins. 25 straight wins belongs to these Canton Bulldogs. But the Canton Bulldogs are no more. That's why the Hall of Fame is in Canton. I always wondered that. And then I was like, oh, okay, that, that makes sense. The, the Canton Bulldogs were disbanded so that teams like the Chicago Bears and the Packers, Green Bay Packers, and the New York Giants could thrive. They had to downsize the league. So they're no more. Switch metaphors again. If I didn't hit you on geography or NFL football, well, let's do blockbuster video. Some of you that grew up in my era, my generation, remember Blockbuster. It was a classic American franchise. It was a movie and video game rental store. At its height in 2004, they had 9,000 stores all over the world, 84,000 employees. And they were famous for the tagline, make it a Blockbuster night. I mean, I can remember going in and you'd go straight to the new release wall and look and see what they had and wander around for hours, it seemed like. One year they made, I think this was in the early 2000s, one year they made $800 million just by collecting late fees. <laughs> it's not a bad gig, right? All they do is 
Yeah. So, uh, but, but, as we know, Blockbuster couldn't compete with Netflix and Redbox. And except for one store that's a holdout in Oregon, Google last Blockbuster, and you can read the funny story about that store that's still holding on. Basically, Blockbuster Video is no more. All these organizations that we've talked about, right, at one time were great successes, big success stories. They dominated their industry, they dominated the sport, they dominated the world, but none of them lasted. All those things that we've talked about are gone and are no more. And so why would I highlight these? Why would we start here? Well, the answer is because we, this morning, if you are a part of the church, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, confessed him as your Lord, believed that he uh, was uh, crucified on the cross when raised from the dead, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you, friend, are a part of the one organization that will last not just throughout this earth's history, but throughout the history of eternity. That's what the church is. It's what we are. It's what the bride of Christ is. Jesus promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. Apostle Paul said, through the church, the eternal mysteries of God are being revealed and made known to the world. Paul over in 1 Timothy says that it's the church that is the pillar and buttress of truth. And so long after this world's kingdoms and corporations and clubs are just a distant memory, the church of God will be strong and vibrant and on into the new heaven and new earth because we are his bride, his people And so this morning we're talking about what is the church as we launch this series. What is the church? Well, it's not a building, right? We know that probably. But what is a church? What does it do? Where do we collectively as people fit into the church? How is the church led? Well, all these questions are things that we're going to be talking about uh, from each of your staff pastors over the next uh, six weeks or so. We're going to be thinking about trying to answer these questions, cast vision for thinking about with you, what is it that God has made us as the church to be? And along with what has he called us then, not just to be, but do. And so to get us started this morning, we're going to start with a definition, definition of the church that I hope is going to help kind of frame our thinking. Thinking, what is this thing that we are a part of? Um, And hopefully this will help us both today and serve us in the coming weeks as well. Here's the definition uh, coming up on the screen. The the church is God's redeemed people who gather and scatter for his glory. Church is God's redeemed people which gathers and scatters for his glory. We're going to be fleshing that out a bit, filling that out both this morning and in the coming weeks. And this morning, as I I said, uh, we're going to start in Ephesians 2. So if you've got that, Ephesians 2, just going to read 2.19 on down to 22. And uh, here now, this is God's words for us, his church, his people. Paul says, so then, so then, you are no longer strangers and aliens But you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is God's word. Let's pray as we start our time. Lord, would you this morning, as we dive into this, God, would you help us to wrap our minds around the beauty and scale and scope of your church, your bride, your people? Would you help us to even understand that from the scriptures this morning? And God, would you begin stirring in our hearts a love for this thing that you are doing to unite a people together? to live together as a family and grow together and then even scatter for the good and advancement of your name and your great kingdom. So God, would you give us understanding and grace this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So right away, we just get to talk about the gospel because it's the gospel that has brought us into the church. And so if you're in Ephesians 2, there at the end, look up to the beginning of chapter 2. Just understand how he's starting talking about the gospel and what the gospel has achieved. He begins by just saying, hey, we were dead. Before Christ, we were dead in our sins. As Pastor Andrew read from Ezekiel, that was us. We were dead. We had nothing to commend ourselves to God. But now, for those of us who are Christians, Paul says, this is down in verse 4, he says, now, because of God's rich mercy, because of his great love, even while we were his enemies, God has come and made us alive with Christ. And the way he's done that, it's not that we did it. He has done it by the twin gifts, two gifts of grace and faith. It's not the result of anything that we have done. We see that in 2, 8, and 9. It's totally the result of what God has done in his mercy. And so then, starting in verse 11, Paul is going to begin focusing specifically on Gentiles. Gentiles, took me a long time to, to, to get these categories in my mind. So if you're still struggling, no, no worries. Um, Gentiles are just non-Jewish people. They're not ethnically Jewish people. Um, and basically, that's probably every person in this room. We're non-Jews. We are Gentiles. And so he's going to be talking to the non-Jews, the Gentiles, and he's going to take them now in these verses, 11 on down to the end of the chapter, he's going to take them back to the time when uh, they they first believed in Jesus, or before the time that they first believed in Jesus. And so picking up in verse 12, he says, guys, remember, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. And so just so you can understand that, in the, in the old covenant that God had established with his people Israel, all the blessings of God flowed through that. And so if you wanted to be blessed and connected to God, then you had to identify with Israel. So if you weren't born a Jew, and you could, you could become a convert and do some things, but if you weren't born a Jew and naturally connected You were born outside of God's people. You were cut off from fellowship and without access to God. And so because all of us are sinners by nature and choice, again, go back to one there. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. It's the way we are, naturally speaking. Following the course of the world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is a work in the sons of disobedience. We're children of wrath, he says. Because that's who we are naturally, We are born cut off from God. We are born spiritually dead. And that means our lives are ultimately hopeless because we were without a way to get back to God. And if we're apart from God, our maker, the one who wired us up to know him and live for him, then ultimately we're also cut off from the source of real and lasting and true joy. And so the existence that we're living apart from Christ is just that We've got this looming doom of eternal separation, this threat that's hanging over our heads. But look at what he gets to next. Fortunately, if you've been made alive with Christ through faith in him, here's what happens. Now, this is verse 13, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He's saying that at one time, we had no claim on any of the promises of God. We had no expectation of sharing in any of his blessings and goodness. We were far off. We were in the wilderness, just wandering around apart from him. But now, God in his mercy has brought us near through the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. And he goes on, verse 14. He himself is our peace. Not about Jesus. Jesus is our peace. He's made us both one. The the us is Jew and Gentile. He's made Jew and Gentile both one. He's broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments, expression, ordinances, that he might create uh, in himself, in Jesus, one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And so this is what he's doing. He's reconciling two different groups of people together to bring peace and oneness. And where once only Jews had this privileged access to God, now all of a sudden, because we are in this one body that's happened through the cross, all of a sudden we are heirs. We're inheriting all of these benefits. It's like all of a sudden you're part of this family with this really fat inheritance that's going to be passed to you. 
It's exactly what's happened to us. And so again, if you get lost in the Jew-Gentile stuff, let me just kind of bottom line it for you. God has made one people, one people of God who know him and enjoy him. And he's done it through the cross of Jesus. And that people, the redeemed people of God, that's what we call the church. We are the people of God bought by his blood on the cross. And so the church is both universal and local. And the church is both invisible and visible. So universal church, it's invisible to the human eye. Its members are known only to God. It's made up of every genuine believer in Christ who ever lived in any era. That is the universal church throughout all ages, throughout across all cultures, across all denominations, no denominations. And so that's the universal church. But then there is a local visible church. That's what we're gathered in this morning. And the local church is the place where covenant members gather together in order to grow to maturity. And then we scatter to spread his light in the darkness. That's what the local church is. And there's this connection between the two. Every Christian in the New Testament that we see, with the possible exception of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts, there's always an exception. If you want to talk to me about the exception, come find me afterwards. We don't see him visibly connected to a church, but I think as soon as he got saved and got back to his homeland, he started a church. So anyway, that's a conversation we can have offline. But every other Christian in the New Testament that we ever see is connected to a local church. And so if you ask me, Michael, is it possible to be part of the universal church and not be part of a local church? Well, my answer for you would be, yeah. Yeah, it's possible, but it's also irregular as far as the New Testament understands it. It's irregular. It's not normal. Regular Christianity, as the New Testament understands it, and the New Testament, I hope, is our authority for all these things, regular Christianity involves being covenantally connected to a local church. And so just, that's a couple of implications, Right? First, maybe the me and Jesus sort of approach to Christianity that can be popular nowadays. You know, I'm just going to watch a preacher on TV or I'm going to watch a podcast, listen to a podcast, or you know, I'm just going to do my own thing. Uh, you talk to a New Testament Christian and they're just looking at you really strange, like they have no idea what you're talking about, right? Uh, the, the idea that I'm just going to somehow forever float among churches, kind of sampling and tasting the best here and there, but never actually committing, again, that is not something that is heard of in the New Testament. And so just a, just a quick word of exhortation for those of you who maybe have been visiting freedom for a while, um, even maybe not for that long. I would just say to you, listen, you, you understand, when there is no pressure. You do not need to connect with us as a church, all right? With, with us specifically as a church is what I mean. But you need to covenant in membership somewhere where there will be people, pastors who are going to lock arms with you and keep watch over your souls as those will give an account, as Hebrews 13 talks about, and where you will be connected to other saints who are similar, going to be keeping watch over you and holding you accountable and seeking to walk with you. And it's not just, and that's, that's how you can grow into all that God expects and has for you. And it's not just the for you, that's a little self-centered, kind of focused way of thinking about it, but the church needs you. The church needs you. The church needs you to come alongside and commit and engage deeply so you can be a blessing and serve others, right? And so just my exhortation is don't date the church, make a covenant with her. Don't date the church, make a covenant. And so what is the church? Well, we've said it's the redeemed people of God who gather and scatter for the glory of God. But this morning, where we are in Ephesians 2, is going to take us a little bit deeper. I want to dig a little deeper into this. What is the church? Paul is going to give us three descriptions just in these short verses of what the church is. And so I want to look at these with you in our time together today. So first off, first description of the church happens in verse 19. Just the first part, A. It's that we are, the church is the citizens of God's kingdom. We are citizens of God's kingdom 
So just see that right there in verse 19. So then you are no longer, and he's going back, right, to who you were previously. You're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. We'll just pause it, stop right there. And so just to go back, again, he's saying, listen, when you were outside of the people of God, when you didn't belong to his church, you were separated, you were cut off. You're outsiders, you were foreigners. And, and really the, the kind of the underlying thing is we just didn't belong. We, were, we didn't belong, we didn't fit in. But now, look at the status and the privilege we hold. We are fellow citizens with the saints. We belong You've experienced that, right? Like you've been someplace where it's like, man, this is not my scene. I don't fit in here. These are not my people. I feel really strange. And then you get back home or wherever with your people. It's like, oh yeah, I belong. Like this is, this is good. Friends, we belong with the saints. We belong here. We're joining the fellowship of God's holy people. That's what saints means. It's not a Roman Catholic thing. We are holy. Every person who is a Christian is a saint, we're not holy by our own works or by our own life, certainly not, but by the righteousness of Christ. And so we are all saints. And not just saints, but we are citizens of God's kingdom, he says. And so over in the book of Philippians chapter 3, he will say that our, our citizenship as God's people is in heaven. Or then we look at the saints that are mentioned in Hebrews 11. It says that they went out looking for a better country, a heavenly one. And so we are citizens of the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus came to proclaim, that the kingdom of God is at hand. It's the inbreaking of his kingdom. And just so you understand, the kingdom of God is not some sort of physical territory, right? It doesn't have membership in the UN. I mean, we're not going to put a map of it like we did of the British Empire up there. It's not a physical territory. You can't find it on Google Maps. Ways is not going to give you directions to the kingdom of God, all right? Uh, it's the place, though. The kingdom of God is the place where God's people are in his place under his rule and blessing. That's, that's the kingdom of God. And so as Christians, we are waiting on the day that we will set foot in the perfect kingdom. The perfect kingdom. That will be heaven for us first, and then after that, a new heaven and new earth. That's what I think the scriptures teach. And then we will be in God's presence forever as his people under his rule and blessing. But for now, for now, we are in the church proclaiming that future reality and we're longing for our homeland even as right now we are citizens of that kingdom that we're looking forward to. And so maybe you're wondering, okay, so this is, this is fine, this is what the Bible says, but, but what does it matter here that he's using this description that we're citizens of his kingdom invisible kingdom no physical territory what does that matter for maybe you in the day-to-day -day of understanding the church well i think it helps us understand what it is that we're doing as we gather here so just think about this think about if you're traveling internationally you're traveling overseas and let's say you're in india you're shopping you're in an open air market minding your own business looking at all the stuff and then all of a sudden you're pickpocketed you lose your passport and your visa. You're a stranger in a strange land, don't speak the language very well, and now you've lost all of your identification. What are you going to do? That's a very serious situation. How are you going to get out of the country when you can't prove who you are and that you have legal authorization even to be there? Well, here's what you should do if that ever happens to you. You need to get to the U.S. Embassy. Wherever that happens to be, you need to get to the U.S. Embassy. And so just imagine that moment, right? You've, you've lost your ID, you're, you're stressed out. Somehow or another, you find a way, you make it to the U.S. Embassy, you round the corner, and you're in a foreign country, and all of a sudden, you see a flag waving on a flagpole from the U.S. Embassy, and you see the red, white, and blue. And you just think, ah, oh, okay, I'm almost there. You approach and you can read the signs again. And everything's not in a foreign language anymore, right? You read, you come in, the decor, the layout, everything about it is, is familiar. It looks normal. It feels like home even to you. You approach the desk. You're, you're helped by people who speak not just English, but fluent English, right? People who understand you, who are sympathetic with you, who get your culture, who are ready there to help you. 
And suddenly, that very scary, frustrating situation, you begin to feel safe and at home. And while you are on that property, legally, in a lot of ways, it's like being home, away from home. You are safe and secure there. Friends, that, that's exactly what the local church is like for us as citizens of the kingdom. The church is an outpost of the kingdom of God. It's the embassy of the great king. The church is the place where God's people, as we gather, we are cherishing his rule, we're praising his great name, and it is the place that we come and we feel safe and refreshed and home where the people speak our language though often in the world we may feel like strangers in the brokenness and the darkness of it and when we gather with God's church we feel homeness that's a word I don't know and peace that's what we feel when we come here here we are equipped not with replacement passports and visas but we are equipped with the tools that we need to shine as light as we scatter. So the church, the gathered people of God, is like an island of safety in an ocean of terror. It's like a fortified outpost out in the wilderness, in the middle of a war, but we get there and we are safe. So just to be clear, again, I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about the gathering the people of God, as we connect and we gather together, because the church exists wherever, God, wherever God's people gather to hear his word and to practice his ordinances and to maintain accountability with one another. Some of you who have traveled overseas, some of you who have been on mission trips, you'll understand what I'm about to describe. Um, it's both a surreal and a beautiful experience. I remember um, some 20 years ago now, I'm getting old, um, some 20 years ago now, I was a privilege to be able to take a, chip, a trip to, uh, to a western China, a uh, mountainous part. Um, and back in those days, uh, my hair uh, was actually blonde, uh, like my daughter's. Um, and Chinese school children, as we were walking the streets, Chinese school children would come up um, and they would want to touch my blonde hair and rub my white skin, um, see if I was real or something, I guess. It was really weird. Uh, the food uh, was really different. Uh, the culture was very different. The transportation uh, was extremely rough. And uh, I was just trying to smile and muddle through all of it. But when the brothers I was with and I, uh, we were way out in the boonies, uh, finally we made it to a, a home that we were setting out to go to. And we walked into that home and there was a gathering of believers there. Believers in Jesus. Jesus. And while we were there, they took out a book and they began to read from it. And they picked up a guitar and they began to sing. And in that moment, very out of my comfort zone, very culturally in a strange place, in that moment, it struck me powerfully and deeply not just in the intellectual way that I understood it before, but, but powerfully, emotionally, to look these brothers and sisters in the eyes who I could not speak with or understand and to know that they are my brothers, and my sisters, and fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. We, we didn't even speak the same language. And you know, all I knew was ni hao, which is hello, <laughs> and how are you? Not that I could even in, understand the answer to that question. But these were my brothers and sisters, and I, in that moment, we crossed the threshold of their house. I was home, away from home. There in the sticks of China was an outpost of the kingdom of God. And there I was with these strangers I'd never met before, yet I shared more in common with than them with friends who don't know Christ that I have in this culture, in this country, who share so much. But there I was, sharing so many things with them, serving the same king, trying to live my life according to the same principles, living for the same goal, reading from the same book, singing to the same God, and I was home. Friend, that is what the church is. 
the people of God gathered around Christ to glorify him and know him and worship him. And that's what we are. We are brothers and sisters. We're part of this great organism that will last forever. It's real and it's powerful and it's beautiful. The church, the church, friends, is intended to be a little slice of heaven where God's people love and cherish each other and where his rule and his praise are central. And that's what I found there that day in rural China. All of that leads into the next description that the Apostle Paul gives us. He says there back in verse 19, he says, look, we're no longer citizens, so we're no longer strangers and aliens, but we are fellow citizens of the saints. And look at the last part now. We are members of the household of God, members of the family. If you've been tracking the news this week, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, man, they're trying to get out of the royal family, right? Doing whatever they're doing. They've taken a step back. Friends, we have taken a step in. We are now part of the royal family. We've been adopted as sons and daughters. As Romans 8 says, that we have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry out to God, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself is bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we're children, like I talked about earlier, we're, then we're heirs. Heirs of God. We're fellow heirs with Christ. That means we're getting everything that he has. What that means is that God is our father. Jesus is our older brother. Just, friends, if you can, wrap your minds around the greatness of what is happening to us being brought in to the family of God. Understand, God loves you not in some sort of generic, abstract, vague sense that we talk about. You know, God loves you, God loves everybody. You know, in the South, we put it on billboards and whatever else. No, understand what it means to be a part of his family. That means that God loves you intimately. God loves you personally. He loves you with deep knowledge and real affection for you. He is attached to you now for eternity, and you are attached to him. If you're a parent or a grandparent, you can understand some of this in an analogous way, right? I've I found since being a parent, man, I love my kids so deeply. I love them so strongly. I, sometimes I can't even express it. I feel the deep joys that they feel and also the, the deep sorrows and aches when they are hurting. And that's the kind of love our Father has for us. And for us being loved like that, we have all the security of being loved by the Father in his family and being children there. And this is central to what we believe and who we are. I love what J.I. Packer says. He says, if you want to understand or judge how well a person understands Christianity, then find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. Because if that's not one of the foremost things that you celebrate, then you've missed what Christianity is. This isn't a religion per se. Like this isn't just a bunch of rules that we're trying to keep or things we're trying to do. Something profound has happened to us. We've been adopted in to the king's family. We're not just citizens, you know, under the same flag, but we are, we are kinfolk with the same bloodline now. We are brothers and sisters who, as we are growing into the likeness of Christ, we bear a stronger and stronger family resemblance to one another as we're becoming more and more like him. That's what's happening to us as a church. And, and just think about this. If the church is a family with all the relationships that are natural to a family, think about the implications for that as we gather and as we interact with one another. Paul's writing about this over in 1 Timothy. He's given instructions to Timothy about how to set up and lead the church. He says, Timothy, don't rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. And then talk to younger men as brothers. And talk to older women as mothers. And younger women as sisters in all purity. You see, he's describing this familial model. That's what we are. We're a collection of brothers and sisters in this room. 
collection of fathers and mothers in this room. I just want to ask, do you realize that? Do you, I mean, look at the people around you. Do you realize that? That's my brother right there. That's my sister right there. And that sweet sister is like a mother to me in the faith. That brother is like a father to me. Look at, look at your brothers and sisters. Like, you can do it. Like, you're not going to weird some people out because I'm giving you permission. Just look around. Like, do you have deep affection for these people? Do you want to see them succeed and thrive? Do you, in this loving way, have a, like a watchful, protective eye out for one another like a brother or a sister would? I've got two younger sisters. I'm still bitter that I didn't have a brother. I, I couldn't convert my, my two sisters into basketball players or football players, and so I was constantly frustrated because I didn't have people to play with and do the things I wanted to do. But sometimes they annoyed me. Sometimes they still annoy me. But they are my sisters, and that's a bond that will not be broken. I care for them to this day. I care for them deeply. I want what is best for them. Nothing is going to change that. And I just want to say, do you think of the people around you in those kinds of ways? Do you have that kind of care for the saints around you? And not just the brother and sister fat part, but the father and mother part. I praise God for, for people in this room who are fathers and mothers in this church. People that I've learned from, people who give themselves to people who are younger. And I'm just going to be honest with you. We need more people to grow up into that role, to lovingly pour themselves out into the generations coming behind them in age with parental affection and wisdom. And this is not like a title that we're going to see or ever bestow upon you, okay? <laughs> like this is not an organizational chart or we're going to bring you up here and set you apart as a church father or a mother or something. That's not going to happen. This is just a way of thinking about yourself, of realizing, you know what, man, I've been walking with Jesus for a long time. I really could maybe help that brother or sister. Not in a condescending, kind of patronizing way, but just in a way that says, man, I want to serve and give of myself to other people to love and give away what you have. Church, we are a family. And so just to track with that for a minute, as, as a family, as the household of God, the church should be doing at least four things. I'm sure we can come up with many more, but we should be doing at least four things that healthy families do. Let me run through these. One, like families, we ought to love one another, right? And I understand, maybe I should just pause here. I understand that in a room of this size with people of this crowd, not all of your family experiences have been good, right? And so I, I know that. And for some of you, you may be thinking, man, I hope my church family isn't like my biological family. And that, Amen, like I understand that, all right? Uh, we're, we're talking in, in ideal kind of best, best case scenarios. And, and that's part of why we exist as a church, right? For those of us that are coming from difficult places to come home where there is safety and where there is understanding. So families should love one another. Even if our biological families don't, we should, right? It means we should actually care about one another. We should, as the scriptures say, we should rejoice with those who rejoice. We should have sorrow and weeping over those who are weeping. We come alongside for one another. We root for one another. We serve one another. As Paul says in Romans 12, let love in this room for one another be genuine. We should hate, abhor, it's a strong word right there, right? Hate what's evil, hold fast to what's good. We should love one another with brotherly affection. We should outdo one another in showing honor. We shouldn't be lazy in our zeal, but we should be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. We should rejoice in hope. We should be patient in tribulation. We should be constant in prayer for one another. We should contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. That's how we're to live as a family together. Fulfilling along with those things, the other 59 one another's of scripture. 59 one another commands. Here's how you're supposed to carry on together as God's church. And so first, we love each other. Second, like families, we teach one another. And I don't know if it's just because in my own personal family, like we're very much in a teaching phase, right? Like I'm just going to give you an example, and I hope I don't get in trouble for, for saying this, but um, one lesson we're working on um, is that we're trying to teach our children, my son especially, that while poop is a great word, it's not a word that should be used outside the bathroom, all right? So that's where we are in our teaching. He doesn't know that. He doesn't understand that. He thinks the word is hilarious, if you're around him, you will hear him use it probably and you will see and you can judge us like, man, they are still struggling with that. 
But the church should be like a family with fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters helping us obey everything that Jesus has commanded and taught. Helping us live as sons and daughters of the king in this world. Teaching, learning, growing together. Third, like families, the church corrects. And so just to stick with that analogy, right, there are times, many times, as I said, my my son is three years old. He forgets that it's poop stays in the bathroom. That's when we use that word. And so because I love him, because I care about his future life in the world, because I want him to have a right impact in the world and not a wrong impact, we are correcting that. We're coming alongside and training him. It's because we love him that we do that. It's not because we're angry and we're stuck on ourselves, but because I love him, I come and I say, son, you cannot say that. And we're going to discipline you for for continuing to say that. And so what we do as a church, we come to one another and say, brother, sister, have you considered how this may impact other people? Have you considered how this might hurt someone? Have you considered how this might even damage the witness and name of Jesus? And so we are coming along as fellow children of the king, helping each other out, humbly challenging and restoring one another in a spirit of gentleness, trying to help one another grow up into maturity. Because immaturity only hurts all of us. And so we are doing this with tender care. So we're loving each other, we're teaching, we're correcting. And then like a family, we're bearing with one another. Family life is hard sometimes, right? Many of you can give testimony to that. Sometimes we get sideways with each other, we misunderstand one another, we see things differently, we get on one of those nerves, we can go on. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says, Love bears all things and believes all things and hopes all things and endures all things. Familial love is long-suffering, and so it should be that way in the church. Love overlooks offenses, it practices hopeful patience with one another, And so we should be quick to extend forgiveness and also the same grace that we have received. Final description of the church that Paul gives is this. We are the home where God lives. We are the home where God lives. All that God is doing in the church is in verse 20, he says, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows up into a holy temple in the Lord. And then he says, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And so the foundation of the church, the apostles of the prophets, that's nothing more than the word of God, the Bible, which is central to all we do. And then the cornerstone, the first stone that's laid so that everything else will be flush and square and level since then is Christ. He is the foundation but notice what the building program is for. Why is he doing this? We are being built into a holy temple for the Lord. We, each of us who are saints, are being built into this dwelling place for God by the Holy Spirit. If you know your Bible, think about the Old Testament. The Old Testament, what had God done? He had Israel build a tabernacle, a dwelling place for him. And then after that, a temple That was the place that God physically was with his people. Not that God can be contained to tents or uh, temples, but, but that was where he was physically manifest for his people. It's where his presence and his glory were. And now, now, friends, God is making his home with us, in us, by his spirit. God is not tied to holy buildings, but to a holy people. And he lives in us individually, and he lives in us as a community. And all he's, doing, all he's doing this is for his eternal plan. The very existence of us as the church, as the redeemed people, the very next chapter, Paul is going to say, it's, he's doing this so he would bring to light, this is uh, Ephesians 3, 9, if you drop your eye down there, to bring to light for everyone the plan of the mystery that had been hidden for ages in God. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God will be known to rulers and authorities in heavenly places. And all this is according to the purpose that he's now realized in Christ Jesus. See, do you understand? God is using the church. Using the church. Our very existence is his holy people, his unified family, 
to display his glory to the world, to the universe, to angelic beings and everybody else. It's not Google, it's not Amazon, it's not Apple, it's not a military, it's not a government, it's the church. That's why Paul prays at the end of that chapter. Chapter three, he says, to Christ be glory in the church, to God be glory in the church and in Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. It's the most important prayer request, that Christ would be glorified in us. Citizens in his kingdom, the family that he loves, the home where he lives. So that as we gather and as we scatter, the things we do, the people we are, would be like a magnifying glass that is placed on the beauty and goodness of our God. That to a world that watches and who's confused by us, who maybe sometimes wonder, what is God like? They would look at our little fellowship and get a glimpse of who he is. Let's pray. Lord, what a marvelous, mighty thing you have done in the church. Lord, would you help us to grow up into all that you have made us to be. And God, we pray that not for ourselves, but for you and for your glory. Thinking about what Habakkuk says in chapter two, that the the earth would be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I think about that old hymn that I grew up singing, my gracious master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors, the glories of your name. Oh God, would that be true of us as a people, as a church? Now transform us. Lord, help us both to understand And then, God, to live accordingly, even as we continue this series in the weeks ahead. And make us, God, who we are. Lord, help us to live like these realities, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.